Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen. And on today's episode, I've got Matt White. Matt's my hiring coach. He works with Blackjack. He works with our Seven Figure Flipping company on personality profiling. We use a company called Culture Index, and he's our rep for that. He's phenomenal. Today, we talk about everything that's going on right now with the pandemic of coronavirus and the uncertainty that's out there and what all the different personality profile types are feeling right now. So how to get to know yourself and how to get to know your staff, your employees, all of that good stuff. Uh, Really, really, really great episode. And I think it's going to help you as a business owner, even if you're an employee, kind of how you're feeling. And if you know yourself on the DISC or Culture Index or Colby or any of these other profile testing uh, metrics, then uh, a lot of the uncertainty that's going on or the way that you feel is looking through the lens that you have. So we jump right into that and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. So I'm going to cue the theme music and then we're going to jump right in. See ya. Hey everybody, welcome to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen and we've been in this series uh, recently, this kind of like a coronavirus uh, anxiety, stress level kind of talk that we've been doing. Um, I've been sharing a little bit from my side and some of the business owner side. And then what we want to do today is talk a little bit about the staff and employees and different things that uh, we can look for and how we can be better leaders and managers of our team and and our staff. So um, I, I reached out to somebody who I've worked with for the past couple of years. Uh, you might call him like a hiring coach, uh, just knows personality profiles, um, is a culture index rep. And that's what we use. I know a lot of you guys have heard us talk about culture index and the personality profiling that we do as being kind of that first step in our line of hiring. And I think that's really the thing that made us a lot more successful on kind of hiring and managing our team and leading our team over the past few years. So this guy that I'm going to bring on and share with you guys today is uh, the, the best thing that probably could have happened to my business, maybe other than Nate and I meeting, but like, it's just amazing to see the difference that we've had. And I, I have never met anyone more knowledgeable about personality profiles and, and people, frankly, than, uh, than this guy. So, um, I'll tell the story about how we met real quick and then I'll bring him on the show. But uh, Nate uh, set up a, a meeting with him and we had our, like m- myself, Nate, our staff kind of take their culture index profiles. And uh, I, we just kind of met at the sandwich shop and I was like, ah, all right, I'm going to a meeting. I am probably going to be sold something. Let's just see how it goes. Uh, so, you know, Andy McFarland, my mentor told me this thing was a game changer. So obviously I'm going to show up and I'm going to listen. And I went in there and it was seriously like voodoo. Like he, it, he already knew exactly who I was, exactly who my whole team was. He, he, I didn't even talk to him. He basically just laid out every single person in the company, all the problems that we are having, all the problems we're probably going to have in the future. And maybe some of the stuff we've had in the past. I seriously, at the end of this, I was like, okay, this is a little bit eerie. You're like a, a fortune teller slash business consultant slash, I, I don't know. So, um, And it was just incredible to see that all that stuff could happen just from a couple sheets of paper and and a profile that seriously took me like two to three minutes to take. So um, anyway, without further ado, I want to bring out on my now good friend and obviously uh, business mentor and coach, Matt White. Matt, how are you? Man, I'm fantastic considering uh, the pandemic that we've got going on and um, spending the last six weeks on Zoom meetings. But other than that, fantastic. Well, uh, welcome to my life. I pretty much am on Zoom calls doing podcasts and meetings with the team and all that stuff. And um, well, I don't even really have to say, you probably already know that that really doesn't bother me that much. (laughs) So so why don't, uh, you know, obviously my introduction was a lot about kind of how we met and uh, like half joking around, but serious. At the end of that meeting, when we first met, I was basically like, you already knew how this whole meeting was going to go before you even walked in here, I think. So what am I going to say next? And you were basically like, you basically rolled it out. You're like, well, we're going to do business together if this, this, and this can be done. And you're already thinking about, you know, the future of what we can do with lots of other people and other things. And uh, it was really, I don't know, kind of interesting. I think you have, um, it's almost like a cheat code that you have to people and, and business and life by reading those things before going into a meeting. I wish us as as uh, real estate investors, we could read that stuff bef- of sellers before we went in to have a conversation with them at the appointment, right? So, yes, it's like a cheat sheet. So, why don't you tell everybody who's kind of like unfamiliar with culture index and maybe just unfamiliar with personality profiles completely? Why don't we start there? 
I know we've talked about it a lot at Flip Hacking Live and some of the presentations that I've given and on the podcast, but there's probably somebody, some people that are listening that have no idea what we're even talking about. Yeah, so <clears throat> just at a very high level, I mean, personality profiles have really been going around since like the Desert Fathers a long time ago that studied the four major personality types and from like melancholy to sanguine and so forth. And then it's obviously evolved. And, um, you know, really in the past, since the early 20s, um, mid to late 20s is where you've really seen a blend of science and math coming into, and psychology coming into play in, in evaluating personality and um, being able to create index so, so that you get a lot more accurate data on what you're looking at with human beings. And so just in a nutshell, you know, I'm sure most people are familiar with Myers-Briggs, DISC, uh, those are really widely known personality uh, surveys or instruments. Um, the, the, those are all helpful, but at the end of the day, the, the, dis, the difference between a culture index and one of those other personality profiles is that culture index was a business program created by Gary Wallstrom in the, actually in 99. And um, it, it uses human analytics that statistically blow the competition away in terms of being able to predict the behavior that you're going to get from a human being. And really it's rooted in science and a lot of math and a lot, it's, it's just psychometrics. Um, but the, the magic with culture index, they took all this research, all this accurate data, and then actually made it in a form that we can use as business owners to learn what is this person really, really good at? What are they going to do under pressure and how can I design that or use this data to scale and build out my teams. And so what we do inside the program is it's pretty simple. We just interpret and mobilize that data. Uh, and, and again, we just work exclusively with entrepreneurs and CEOs because it all start, it starts at the top and everything flows down from the top, right? If you don't know who you are, if you don't understand yourself, it's going to be difficult to lead other people. Um, and so we just help you help them use that data to scale their business. You know, we know that human, uh, or, Human beings, uh, your greatest leading indicator of P&L performance or human capital. And if you, you know, we're all, most, I would assume most people listening into this uh, podcast are business owners. You know, you don't look at your P&L statement and make decisions based off data that's 50 or 60 or 70% accurate. You need accurate numbers. Well, it's the same thing with your human capital. Literally, I mean, the most, the greatest leading indicator of P&L performance is your human capital. And so if, if we are not in this day and age taking advantage of psychometrics to help scale, and yet it is about hiring, but it's even more so, it's like with the existing people that you have on your team, what's a 10 or a 20% bump in productivity worth when you think about you've got a one, two, five, ten million dollar payroll? Well, if we can teach leaders how to use data instead of gut or just treating other people the way they want to be treated, how to use that data to drive performance, we're making a lot more money at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, you mentioned a couple of things like what you're good at and what you do under pressure. And the one thing that stood out to me, you did, you came, we did this Dash 2 event for uh, CEOs and COOs, um, you know, earlier uh, to end of 2019. And you mentioned something that kind of stood out. And I don't know if it was a refresher for me, but something that has hung with me for that last like six, seven months. And it was, um, this is really who that person is when they're under pressure and they're under stress. So you can kind of fake it throughout the day or the week if you're really thinking about it, make, basically modify from who you are. But this is who, this is who you get and what you get when you're under pressure and stress. And that to me, in the back of my mind said, wow, that, it's profound because like, when do I really care about the person that I'm gonna get? Like, when do the big problems happen? It's when we're under pressure and stress and we have to perform. So then I know this person is really just gonna chit chat and not get anything done, or this person, they're gonna go back. So a lot of times I feel like uh, some of their personality and, and who they like deeply rooted are can hide in a decent performer until that comes out, like that stress. Like when Michael Jordan gets the ball with two seconds left, he's going to perform right where somebody else might choke. So I want that person who wants the ball at the end and the person who I know of what I'm going to get when they're under stress. So that's kind of what stood out to me. And you kind of, you just mentioned it and touched on it, which I've never really thought about it like that for some reason until you mentioned it. So I wanted to bring it out for the listeners because a lot of times it's like, well, you know, I did this profile on them 
it's not who they are at work right now. Like I've seen them, I've, they work for me for a year or two. That's not who they are. They, they actually do this. So what's your answer to that a lot of times? Cause I know you work with people who like you came into in that meeting with me and we're like, this person is, uh, is going to have problems. And I'm like, what, wait, 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 they're doing a great job, you know? Yeah. And so what you're speaking to is what we see when we use the term personality. I mean, that means a lot of different things to different people, but essentially in, inside the culture next program, when we talk about someone's personality, you've got, you've got your traits that are inherent in you. And I mean, most psychologists and psychiatrists are saying now that the bulk of your personality is developed and cooked and finished by the age of 12. And so your, your trait or, and by the personality, they mean your traits. And so our traits are inherent in us. Uh, you know, it's a product of DNA, God given, uh, DNA, but then also about it's your environment. And I don't know the exact percentage on what exactly nature versus nurture on what forms your personality. What we do know is that by the age of 12, you're done. And so what we're able to look at is in the traits that we measure, these seven work-related traits, from that, that's going to be what that person does and who they are. And when you see it the most is in two, two situations. One, when someone's under stress, you see who they are. And then two, when they're at home, right? Because when we come to work, there's naturally the pressure to perform. And whether that's, you know, consequences, uh, social norms, whatever it is, human beings can modify our behavior. What we're trying to do inside the program is if, if, the, if your talent or your, or your traits, what we're trying to say is as business owners, what's the value to us if we can get traits to figure out what is this person good at? What, they, what would they do even if they didn't get paid for it? That's where you're going to find their passion their, and not necessarily skill set, but their natural God-given, God-given abilities. That's, that's your trait. Behavior is what you see in an interview. Behavior is what you see in the first 90 days on the job because we can all modify our behavior. But how much sense does it make, you know, for me, if, if I'm naturally gifted to write with my left hand and then I come to work for you and you're asking me to do something that I suck at, i.e. write with my left hand, man, I could have all the passion and heart and grit in the world, but I'm still going to be writing with my left hand. That will take me more time, energy, and effort to do that job than if you gave me something to do that I was right-handed. Not to mention the fact that how much more engaged will I be if I'm doing what's natural for me? Yeah, I think, I think that's a big thing because a lot of times we, we try to fit like a square peg in a round hole or vice versa. And it just, it, you, you kind of, while they can get it done, it can work. And it works to some point maybe. But really, when you talk about the bottom line and talking about each person and, and really getting as much as you can, the, the other side of it is not just like, getting as much value out of that human being, right? Or yourself. It's also the fact that they feel like they are part of the team and they love what they do. Uh, so yeah. you, you mentioned that briefly. It's for me, like, a lot of the times, it's not a hundred percent of the time, a business owner and entrepreneur is not doing everything that they want to do. Right. And, and I think that goes for any job. It's not a hundred percent, but it's certainly, if it was 50, 50, I'd be going crazy. So I really want to be in my world where I get kind of fueled up instead of drained down all the time every day I go to work. So um, it's, it's interesting to think uh, about all that stuff because people now when we implemented this program and we brought people in, we hired them that way and we managed to it, they come to me and say, you know what, I've never had a boss or an owner or anybody that I've worked with that's ever actually cared what I thought. Like cared how, how my um, quality of life it was and, and the, the work output and what I really enjoyed doing. Like we move some people around. And in fact, I've even let some people go and I'll get a message from six months later just saying, thank you. Like I found what I really love doing and I just want to say thank you. I know it, was, it wasn't the decision that I, that I thought was good for me at the time, but now looking back, you were right. And it's really cool to hear that. And I don't think I would have ever kind of heard that or, been, or, or had the ability to do that if it wasn't for, you know, something like this. So, um, you know, um Jim Collins said, and I'm paraphrasing this when in good to great, um, you know, he said the, the, the minute that you realize you made a hiring mistake, um, when you don't take action, you're robbing that person of minutes of their lives that they could be spent doing, they could be spent doing something that they're better gifted to do, you know? And so there's a lot of us that hang on to people because as entrepreneurs, how did we live life? Figuring it out on our own. 
we'd naturally assume that other people can do that as well. And then we would put them in roles where they need to be autonomous. But yet since the age of 12, mommy and daddy told them what to do. We're making their life really hard. Yep. Well, uh, 12 years old, get those traits. It's interesting we talk about traits because I had Gino Wickman on the podcast a little while ago and we talked through his new book, Entrepreneurial Leap, which is the traits of the entrepreneur. So we went through all six traits and then I did a series on it with uh, people that I know afterwards and, um, and went and like deep dove into every single trait. So he mentioned six traits and exactly that. It was kind of like built in their, in their DNA. It was in their, uh, in who they were, you know? So, um, and I, so I got six more years to make sure that my oldest, um, uh, is, is molded the right way, right. To, to kind of roll them out. And then the next one, I got nine more years and the next one, 10 more years. So that's, uh, I'm glad that I, you, you gave me a timeline now to, to get after them. So, yeah. um, so why don't we talk through some of those? Is, is that the best next way to go? Kind of talk through some of the traits and kind of the things that stand out. I think that might be helpful for them. And then yeah. from there, what we can do is we can kind of go into uh, some of the anxiety and stress levels right now of what's going on and how those different people might be feeling. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So we measure, we measure seven work related traits and culture index. And so I say work related just to signify that this is not a clinical instrument you know you can't look at this and predict whether or not they've got mental issues you know ptsd affects this as well but essentially these seven work-related traits that we measure are these um number one is autonomy um which is a desire to control your future or destiny two is social ability this is where someone's confidence com is coming from uh building relationships and being liked number three is pace or patience where we use that one to look at what kind of change and variety does someone uh, respond to best in their work environment. Um, the fourth is conformity. We're measuring how much someone needs, wants, and seeks rules, policies, and procedures before they get started in work and how much they, do they want to be accurate and perfect versus carefree and outside of the box. We measure mental stamina. So it's a Every, every human being's got a, it's like a battery in their brain that tells us how long that they can attempt to modify behavior before they wear out, which goes back into, and you talk about engagement, is when we're asking our people to become somebody they're not, they won't last forever. Um, and the sixth is logic, uh, which is emotional control, and the seven is ingenuity or inventive thought. And so, you know, I mean, if you're familiar with DISC, those are four, DISC, Myers-Briggs, these are four quadrant assessments. Um, what we do with ours, though, uh, from an analytical standpoint or from a validity standpoint is they spent about five and a half years to build Culture Index to prove out the, val the validity that um, ours comes back at 90% valid. And so when you think about making decisions, do you want decisions, you want data that's 70% or 50% or 90% accurate as it relates to you know, your payroll and your future. And so just from an accuracy standpoint, um, it's spot on. It's a little bit more challenging to talk about something if we actually don't have the data to interpret and apply in this case, but those are the seven traits that we measure. Cool. So that's the, and probably what we'll focus on is the, that A, B, C, and D. So that A is autonomy, B, social ability, C, pace and patience, and D, conformity. And, um, and so what, what I like when we look at this, and, and probably we, we don't have a ton of time, obviously. I mean, the, the setup that we had to get trained is multiple days of training on this. Um, we have a manual that I re reference to all the time. Um, we have access to you, obviously, where I'm constantly bouncing questions off when we're hiring somebody or have a key hire. Um, one of them to, to mention was my personal assistant. I have had trouble kind of going through a couple different profiles, a couple different people. I, tr I thought that you know, a certain person and, and resume was going to beat the index and I was wrong. And so, um, you know, you and I have worked together quite closely on that now to hire the one that I have now. So who's, she's done a, an, a, an amazing job. So I think if we, if we stay at that ABCD, it's almost like the disc. So if you're familiar with the disc, um, you can just think like the D is like the A. So D I S C A B C D just go down through that. And um, let's talk a little bit about that because yeah. the, really when I look at somebody's profile and probably the only time that we have to spend is what is the dominant trait of all of those? 
So if you can kind of explain that maybe as the high level thing, because there's also a relationship between the different traits that plays into it that we're definitely not going to have time to, especially when you don't have a whiteboard and a pen and, and no. to go through it all. So um, there's a, a dominant one of these kind of four traits on there. And that kind of defines uh, you know, something in that person. If you can just talk to that a little bit. Yeah, so we use that to really look at and then cover what's the primary intrinsic motivational drive of this human being. And for all humans, humans, as, and again, as it relates to work, it's going to be the need to achieve and win and be in control of where I'm going, which is if your A is the highest. Uh, B is the need to build relationship, to be liked. Social um, power comes is what builds the confidence for when your B is the highest. And then the D trait is conformity. And so when that trait is your highest trait, it means your confidence comes from knowledge and your ability to be perfect. Um, and so those are the three primary drives in a human being. And some people can have, you know, in Bill's case, he has a high A and a high D. And when we say high, just to mention this, our data is, is plotted on a Six Sigma uh, sliding bell curve. So we're and, you know, for a lot of times people are, they really grow in self-awareness when they go through the Culture Index workshop because it's the first time that they've, they've seen themselves relative to a, to a norm, you know, or the 50th percentile. Because lots of people say, oh, I'm, a, I'm aggressive. I say, well, okay, how aggressive? You know, really aggressive. Well, we compare you against the average human walking around on the planet. So we know, oh, you're actually more aggressive than 98% of the people on the planet. That's why you suck at communicating to people. Are you talking about me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to communicate to all the people that are listening to this podcast. I'm trying to do the best I can. But you're right. I, I'm, uh, I definitely struggle with it. There's no doubt. And I can't even like you, you, myself and Mike Simmons, and you know, Mike Simmons, we throw stones at each other from time to time, just joking around. Like I can't even defend myself with you. Like you just look at the dots and say, no, you have, I already know who you are. Even at that sandwich shop, it's like you, and it's because you knew like other clones of me walking around the earth probably that you've dealt with and you know the way that I'm going to react and the things that I'm going to say. Obviously, like you said, my mental state, who I, like my background, a lot of that stuff doesn't come into play, but ultimately to the core, you're like, I can already kind of understand where this guy's going to be coming from. And you knew exactly how to pitch me, which was interesting. <laughs> well, you know, the interesting thing, let me talk about the, the, the piece about sucking at communication as an example, especially since most of the people on here would likely be high A's and that might apply to them. The reason why I would say a high A would suck at communication is because the A trait measures how far into the future someone naturally thinks. So then if you put it on that scale, like a you or a Mike Simmons, that's off the chart in the extreme compared to the rest of the world and how far into the future they think the reason why they quote unquote suck at communication is because if I'm, and I got this from you. I don't know if you remember a long time ago, but I said, hey, when you're flying at 30,000 feet, how far is a one degree trajectory change in the air on the ground? And I think you said 700 feet. Well, it was like the reason why you would suck at communication if you're a big visionary is because you fly at such a high level relative to the rest of the world. When you give a direction and somebody else is on the ground, they can't pick up all of the spaces and things that you left out in between where they are and where you see. And so that's one of the key problems. Of, and I see in entrepreneurs, you know, I'm fairly involved in entrepreneur organization here in Nashville, tons of high A entrepreneurs here. And one of the reasons why they can fail to really scale their businesses is because they can't bring enough people around them that can keep up with them. And then also why they don't want to bring around other high A's is because they don't like to be challenged. You know, and so that's like the, the conundrum for a, a high A entrepreneur is I'm not going to slow down to give enough detail, but yet I, I want to be the one to call the other shots. And so you effectively limit your ability to scale yourself out of the business. Yeah, uh, it, you're right. I mean, I, I, I definitely struggle with that. And Nate and I talk about that a lot. And we've mentioned it at like presentations that we've done and things. We, we want to get, we just want to get from A to Z and we don't want to show everybody all the steps along the way. We expect you to show you the finish line and expect you to know how to get there. So we have to be conscious of that, especially with somebody who's not a high A. And, um, you know, most of the people, like you said, in entrepreneurship, in the mastermind group of ours, they're primarily high A's and the rest of it is kind of different. They might be a high B, there might be a, a lot yeah. of, a lot of high A's, high B's, low C's, low D's in this world, you know, um, those kind of daredevils that we have. And so, um, what we see is there's not a lot of detail. There's all these different things. So let's, 
let's come back in. We've got uh, kind of autonomy. You mentioned it's this, this high A. And so you didn't mention the C. Does the C come into play? You just mentioned the three. So is, it, can a C be a dominant uh, trait or is that just something that's a, a secondary? Good question. Yeah, so when, when we're using the high A, B, and D, what we're using this data for is how do we figure out what button can I push and know that I'll get this response, which is I'm ready to run through a brick wall for you. And whenever you find out if that person a high A, high B, or high D, if I can figure out how to leverage their gift there and speak into that, whether it's they want more challenge, whether they want more relationship from me, whether they want more knowledge, the more I do that, the more that they will buy in, stay engaged, and be motivated on our teams. The reason why we don't put in the C trait is that there's no confidence building mechanism in a C trait. It's simply looking at how much change does this person need in their work environment? So if you're above average in the pace or patience trait, it means that you respond more positively when you're, because you're single task focused, you've got a long mental attention span. They do their best work when they get to say orderly, sequential, one thing at a time, and they're insanely productive so long as they're not having to deal with low C's who love fire drills. Yeah, uh, that's me. So, um, you know, so we got this high A, we've got this person who's kind of, um, you know, out there up in the, up in the sky, really high level person, or I shouldn't say high level, just not down in the weeds is thinking about the future, seeing in the future. And then, um, the high B. So th those, and those people are kind of, you know, social, want to be liked, uh, want to interact and, and build relationships and things like that. And you've got these, um, these, this D trait that's more of the perfectionist kind of thing, this um, uh, follow rules, uh, process, systems, that kind of thing. So those are the high traits of those. Um, I really like what you said about like, knowing that, that just one primary thing and knowing what to, what to kind of pour into that person. So um, as, a, as a business owner, you mentioned knowing who you are. So uh, over the past few years, and fr frankly the past two since, I, since that meeting, that we had basically, it was like I was unlocking the matrix, right? Like I, <laughs> I was, it was something that I, I had, we'd use the disc. I understood what my disc profile was like. I had taken it multiple times. It had changed around a lot. I kind of had said, okay, I'm, I, the first one's probably the most accurate. That's probably pretty close to who I was. And then I took this profile, you talked to me and, we, and then I've had the class and it really dug me deeper into the root of wh who everybody is. And what that did was it allowed me to, to be okay with the fact that I was good at some things. And it's like, like each one of these things I feel like are a strength and a weakness. So uh, however you play into it, right? So I know, I know my strengths and how, how I can pour in my, how I can best affect my business and other people with the, the, the gifts that I have. And then that same thing could be a weakness if I used it in, in a different way. You know, so it, I think it can be a good thing or a bad thing. So the, the second that you say, this is who I am, I'm not going to change it. I'm going to pour into turning every one of these traits into a positive and then figure out how to build a team around me specifically where we can be as effective as possible and they can cover all my gaps. So instead of kind of strengthening my weaknesses and working on that, being strong in my strengths and fortifying my weaknesses with other people and staff who are strong in those areas, like, right. The, the little stuff, the detail stuff, the, the perfectionism, the, the kind of slow and methodical, like I, and the low A's, like I need some of those people around the team. Otherwise, nothing would get done. If it was me and Nate and a bunch of other people like us, which is what a lot of businesses become in the beginning, I feel like, is because you see yourself in a bunch of other people and you just amass a bunch of army of yourself. You have so many blind spots and weaknesses. So, I mean, would you agree with that? Like getting to know yourself is probably like the first step. Absolutely. You know, um, and I would say this too, this came up when you're talking, you know, when we talk about the A, the B, and the C, you know, essentially for companies, we move three dials, um, you know, revenue, bottom line growth, and then scalability. And then when you take those, those three primary driver traits, the net net is the A trait is the gas pedal for growth. So that's the gas for top line sales and growth and strategy. B is the glue or the weld because you could have all the strategy all day long, but if, no, if, if you treat people like trash and nobody wants to work for you, you've got nothing, right? So that high B, their, their superpower is the ability to 
galvanize people around a mission, a vision, the family feel of, of being part of a team. And then that detrace the break. And like when we talk about gas and break, we're talking about top line growth and then bottom line profit, you know? So you literally come into the organizations and you see, man, I've got great top line sales and we're making 3% margin. I know what you need in the company. You need some high D's on your team that can systematize, make things more efficient and drive more bottom line profit. And so it's really, to your point, it's like looking at the existing talent how are we most strategically and effectively maximizing that talent so they're spending a larger percentage of their time doing what's natural for them, either gas, brake, or the glue, which is the high B, and less time on the stuff that they suck at? Yeah, you know, I think, so we mentioned all of these things, you see who you need, and then in your company, I think the next step becomes, for us, this, just the tactical use of this before we move on to something else we basically build out the profiles that what we want. So we look at the accountability chart um, from Traction, like you guys have all heard of, and we say, okay, this position should have this personality profile. This position dictates this person. And we can kind of build that out. And then what we do is we run our ads to, to that profile. So they have to take this culture index profile assessment before we'll look. And we use this database like a CRM. We use our culture index database like a CRM as our leads come in. And then we start looking at their resume. So they can attach their resume to that uh, culture index profile. We'll look at the resume. If the resume matches, um, if the pro profile matches what we want and the resume looks good, then we'll interview. So it, it saves us a ton of time. This is kind of the, the technique and, and structure that we use. And so then what uh, Matt's talking about is in your company, if you need a position that, that does need a high D, you build out that profile and that goes on your accountability chart. So in the beginning, it's like, this is the person that we're looking for. It doesn't have somebody in the seat yet but you know that, that is, um, that's the personality profile that you want. So that's kind of how we use it for a very high level. And then what, where I want to go to is, um, is how, can we, um, how can we manage, like right now we've got this, we've got different things going on, stress levels are high, anxiety um, is high. And so if people know who their folks are, whether they're, if they're using DISC, a high D, a high I, or a high C, um, or if they're using culture index, it's an A, B, or D, then how could they, um, Think about that. So themselves, like how they can handle stress and anxiety in times like this. Um, and then how can they kind of coach and manage some of their staff? Because I do want to get to that point, the management side of things, not just knowing who they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, human beings respond to stress differently, number one. Um, and there are different f stressors based off your primary drive in life. Right. The stressor for a high A, you know, ego driven entrepreneur, the typical pattern stress for them is when there's a cap on their ceiling and there's not problems to solve uh, or someone's in their way. If they're having to report to somebody or something like that, um, the stress for the high B. Hey, before you move on, Matt, how does that high A feel? Let's let's go through like what the stress is and then how they feel right now. Do you think like how does a high A feel in this environment right now? Yeah. So I've got, I mean, the majority of my clients are high A's and, you know, you can, you can get your data from the news, but there, there can't be a lot of high A's that are in the news right now because it's gloom and doom. And most of my entrepreneurs and CEOs um, are chomping at the bit, like so opportunistic because the high A is a survival trait. I mean, from the beginning, they've been figuring out what to do as opposed to waiting to be told what to do. And so, I mean, I have multiple clients that have said, man, I've been waiting for this time because they're capitalizing on our record unemployment. They're snatching up talent left and right. They're buying businesses. Um, so again, my, I have a few high Ds. They don't respond to it that way. It's conservative. How do we stay safe? And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing necessarily great about the high A that that's not, you know, so I'm not saying that high A's are great and high D's are not great. The point is, that your personality, those traits will, will tell us how does, what causes you stress. And to your point during this time, what's stressful for the high A? Um, I mean, there's obviously a little bit of fear of the unknown with anybody if you're human and you're honest. Um, but by and large, the high A's that I've seen are very opportunistic and optimistic um, about the future. Yeah. So I, 
as you were talking, I kind of looked down at my phone to look at our text messages to see if I could find like my response to when you asked, how are you doing? Because, and if, if you, anybody's listened to the podcast for any period of time or has been on you know, the, the one webinar that I did is exactly what you just said is exactly how I feel. Like maybe there's a little bit of stress, but it's, it's mostly come from like, let's go. This is, this is, this is actually a great opportunity. There's some, there's, there's, there's stuff in here that we can that we can do. There's a problem. Now I can start fixing it. We can uh, we can build something. We can we can pivot. We can shift. There, it's something new. It's a change. Like I'm really really excited. And sometimes I've had to apologize for that in some of the things that I've said on the podcast or to people. Is like I'm not saying that I'm opportunistic based on people that are struggling, but we live in a distressed world and there's going to be distress and stress that come to the people and we can be able to help them through that. But I definitely see opportunity in all this. And I think it, it, it could be a really good thing for the real estate industry. So I do have to be um, cautious of how I talk and what I share with my staff and my team and things like that, because they're all feeling different than me, or most of them are at least. So exactly what you, the reason I asked is because I wanted to see if this was how I, I was feeling right now, and you totally nailed it. I bet a lot of people that are listening that are high A's are like, oh yeah. And you even mentioned the news. They're like, I, I cannot watch it. I just turned it, no chance. I already didn't watch it before, but I found myself kind of going into that a little bit when all this was happening. And I was like, what am I doing in here? This, this feels horrible. I'm out of here. And uh, I, don't need, I don't have time for that. Like I got time, I got to go build some stuff. So, um, okay, what about the high B? So, if my confidence comes from my relation, relationships that I'm building, think about the stress that this has caused of not being able to go in the office and talk to people, right? And so and there's multiple times when I do my training, you know, when I'll, I'll just ask somebody who's beat rates the highest and say, you know, is, is who you work with as, import, as important as what you do? And they'll say 100% so. You know, now the challenge for high A's and high D's is they have no idea of why they would ever say that who I'm with is as important as what I'm doing. Right. But for a large percentage of the population, I don't know the number off the top of my head, that team environment, that need to be together, to gel together, to create community, which is also gives them their unique ability to read people with intuition, have a lot of empathy and create buy-in and create, I mean, true culture builders, are your high B's. You know, so what's creating stress there is when they've got to go away, they go to their home, they're dealing with a bunch, well, kids are stressful for all of us. I don't care what your dots are, but they're working from home. They're not getting to have that relational, um, you know, deposits. I, I talk about like this because again, a lot of the clients I have are high, high A's and they don't feel the, uh, much of a pull to be liked right? But how do you relate to somebody who's not like you? Well, with the high B, just more frequent check-ins to call and not talk about work. Because when, and my sister's a high B and she's in real estate sales. And when her sales manager, and she's very successful, when her sales manager just, just calls in and just checks on her, how are you doing? Doesn't say anything about work. She's like, it just changes her disposition. And it's like, she just got a steroid shot of passion and excitement to go work more because her boss just took an interest in her. And so the stress for the high B is when I'm not getting to engage with people. Yeah. Which, so know, I think that's, all that's of a, to be proactive at this point. And if you've got, and you know, that's what I've been really encouraged by with a lot of my clients is like their proactive communication has been phenomenal. Um, and I think because they've understand like when I've got people that are relationally driven people, and they're not coming to work, they need more relationship for me. And you've got to make larger and more frequent relational deposits into that bank account if in the long run you're going to continue to have them on your team wanting to add value to the culture. Yeah, this, this, this high B, um, we don't have a ton of these in my company, uh, fortunately, I think, because we're all virtual. So I think a high B would really struggle with the virtual environment all the time and they would constantly be needing to be checked in on. But I have, I've worked with some that are, you know, right there, like the A and the B is like stacked. Yeah. And so a lot of times when, I'll, when I call them and a tip for anybody out there who's working with somebody who's high B or high I, if you're using the disc is, um, is just like Matt said, call and check in on them and just say, before you start getting down to business, like when I call somebody, it's, I don't have time. I don't want to chit chat. I don't want to talk. I don't care about how your cat is. Um, but they do. And if, and so when I started working with Matt, I knew that when I called that person, it would just be like, Hey, how you, I got to set aside five minutes. 
to ask them how they're doing, how their day is, what's going on, remember something about them and be intentional about it. And even though it's not what I want to do, but it is what they need and they want to do. And honestly, at the end, like I, I didn't necessarily always mind it. Um, I would have to translate and they knew I was doing it. Like they, they knew they were like, well, Hey, they're like, Bill, you know what? I really appreciate you uh, saying that. Um, all right. What did you call me about? Like, what do you need? And so, but it was a totally different conversation and outcome from that than it would have been if I hadn't, um, if I hadn't said that. So I think uh, right now in the virtual environment, if you're not typically virtual, they're definitely missing the human interaction side of things. Like uh, I know a lot of our master members, mastermind members are high Bs and we just did a virtual mastermind event in April. And we really tried to be intentional about how we can do different things, network later, do breakout sessions, uh, send them something cool in the mail beforehand, like really do something to make it feel a little bit more like we were in person because I knew that they were going to struggle. And they're just really chomping at the bit to get to the next event in person, give hugs, do all that stuff. They're really missing that right now. So that's the struggle, I think, for them. You're right. What about the Ds, D traits? Yeah, so they're, the D trait drive in life is to be perfect, right? And the way that they become perfect is they gather as much knowledge and historical information as they can because their confidence is built by how much they know. The problem right now in a crisis is no one knows what's going to happen in the future. And so the stress for them is the unknown. And so again, as a leader, none of us can predict the future, but the more information that those high Ds can get um, to remove risk and uncertainty, the more empowered you're making them to go and do their jobs. I wanted to say this too, before I forgot it. Um, you know, when we talk about treating other people the way they want to be treated and especially having the challenge of people that are different than us, you know, it's like when you're, when you're leading a business, the people that work for you, that's, that's like your extended family. You know, I mean, you spend the bulk of your life at work and the interesting thing, you know, there's all these, there's all these books on marriage and things like that, where it would make sense that we'll study the five love languages to know about how to treat our spouse better but yet how much time and energy and effort are we putting into studying our people to how to treat them more effectively? You know, and that's where, you know, when I was a client of culture index for me, it's like, this was a cheat sheet. I don't have to go study anything more. It's right there on the data. And, you know, it, I don't know if you've ever read this book. It's called trillion dollar coach. It's about Bill Campbell. But one thing that sticks out about this guy, and he coached a ton of the Silicon Valley CEOs, was what stuck out was that like there was a true concern about people. And so sometimes to your point, Bill, you're like, well, if they're a high B, then I need to ask them how their day is going. But it's like, yeah, it's true. And maybe that's forced, but the reality is you're doing that because you do care. And um, that's what I love about our program is it's not just how do you, how do you squeeze this person for all their worth? It's like, what are they naturally gifted at? How do they want to be communicated with? And then how do I use that as a leader to make their experience here more valuable so they're more engaged and they feel appreciated and valued? Yeah, you know, that there's a couple of things I want to I mention there. You said that to know that you care. And that was it. Like they they knew that I was I was like doing it because they I knew that they needed it and they knew that I didn't want to do it. And it was obvious, but it does, didn't matter. It was the fact that I was, I, I didn't, I didn't just do what I needed to do and kind of like railroad them to get the, the inf like to get that, that meeting as short as I could so I can move on to the next thing. Um, you know, I do care about them and they saw that. And I think that's why the feedback, like the, people ask us all the time, like how do you, they're, they're looking for a Val. They're looking for a Chad. They're looking for a Nate. They're looking for all of our staff members. And they're like, how do you get these great people? And then how do they stay? Like, why don't they go do their own thing? It's because we're building, like, we're figuring out what they want, what they need. Like, what's, if they need to move up the next level, if they need a title, if they need a, a hug, if they need an emotional paycheck, like, what do they need? And we're figuring it out and, and we're helping them with it. And they know that we really, truly care about them. So they're going to work harder for us than they would for somebody else. And um, you mentioned the word family, and I'm glad that you held up that, uh, that Bill Campbell book because uh, I like really, I, I thought about it as a family before. And I just, I right now think about it as a high performing team, like a Super Bowl winning team. We're building a team around the, the coach, the quarterback, the leaders, like those people. And when I thought of it as a family, I was allowing for dysfunction in my company and when I thought about it as a team, like we don't allow dysfunction in the team. Like it, I'm not going to give the ball to you because it's a contract year. 
I'm going to give you the ball because you're the best player. And the family has that like drunk uncle that'll drive home from a party. And it's just, it's okay because it's like uncle John, you know? And so that's kind of the transition that I know that I made this kind of like growing up from a family to a team. But I will say that I treat my team just like I would any other high performing team. Like I take care of them. I want to make sure that they're doing a great job. I want to make sure that they're healthy. I want to make sure that they're financially fit and healthy and they don't have problems at home and all that stuff. And I'm there for them, regardless of what I want to talk about. It's their time when they have time with me. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, as we move on to kind of like the management of our team and our staff, I think the, the other cool thing about a program like this is we can give this assessment over time and we try to do it every quarter. So then you can see um, there's, there's a section where it talks about like what, what, do you, what does your job role entail or what's needed in what you do? And basically they answer the questions based on what they think they should be doing. And so in the beginning, I might see somebody who's naturally – natural has natural dots a certain way maybe naturally high a but and a lot of times what they do is they answer that question based on the previous position that they were in and I, I usually throw out that bottom part like we talk about but when I see somebody who I talk to in the interview and they're like yeah I answered it how like how I would answer it in the position that I'm currently in I was like Phew. like you are completely inverted from your profile no wonder you hate your job and you're looking for other jobs on indeed while you're still employed full-time and to be able to kind of see their progress and I'm able to see our team members shift into their natural traits and abilities. It, uh, it tells me that, that we're managing them the right way and we're not like, they they don't think that they need to be doing, uh, you can identify things there where somebody thinks that they need to be like very personable and, and, and very outgoing in a high B when they're not a high B and you can kind of catch that before it becomes an issue and a problem and just say, Hey, why, why do you think you, why do you think this, your role entails this, that, or the other? And so uh, maybe you can talk to that a little bit about kind of how we can manage our team and our staff better um, outside of what we just talked about with the stress levels. Yeah. So in terms of management, there's the piece of just the communication and um, understanding what their motivational drives are and how do you leverage that knowledge to get the outcome you want. But the other piece is understanding how are they having to modify their behavior in their current job. I don't know any of them. I'm sure there are some other ones out there that may do that. But that's what I love about the Culture Index program. You know, in fact, you said it was flip-flopped. Um, when I was a client of the program, um, who I was was literally completely opposite of what I was doing uh, in the previous role um, in the company I was a partner in. And the licensee said to me, didn't ask me anything. He just looked at me and said, Hey, how long have you been over the franchising? And I said about two and a half years at this point. And he just looked at me and said, you hate your life, don't you? And I was shocked because like I hadn't told anybody how miserable I was doing what I was doing. And my point here is that, and again, like if there are other ones that do that do it, I don't know if this, I don't think this does it, but the value there in terms of management is like, there's one, there's who a person is. And then the second piece is what are we asking them to do? asking them to do on a day in day out basis. And in that bottom graph, when you're looking at their job behaviors, there are a lot of different factors that influence their job behaviors. Number one, what kind of leadership are they getting for their boss? Number two, who are they working with? Are they on a high performance team or are they having to pick up the slack for somebody else that's on their team? And number three, there's just their own interpretation of what it means to do my job. Um, so that's, you know, Again, that's it's what we coach in the program and, and how do you manage more effectively in light of who that person is and what they're doing, which is where there's um, the when, when you can do a position analysis to under, understand what are the highest traits that are going to drive success in this role, then it becomes easier from the hiring piece of if we hire people who are naturally gifted in those things that we need in this role, managing them doesn't require much work. But like Colin said, you know, the minute you have to tightly manage somebody, you made a hiring mistake. And why might you have to tightly manage? Well, we can't measure character and integrity and values, but you might have to tightly manage Bill Allen. If I hired you to be an accountant because you were a desperate college guy coming out for coming out of college, you needed a job and you had a kid on the way. And all we had was a cost accountant. And I'll stick you back in this corner entering data all day long. I would have to tightly manage you after a while, Bill because you'd be dying inside. Yeah, I wouldn't do that job. 
I know myself too well to, uh, to, to not be at all interested in that now, right? So, and, and that's what you hear people all the time say, like, I can never work for somebody again. Uh, you know, something like, I've never, you know, I'll always work for myself. They, they started, they've gotten to know themselves. Like, if you've gone through three or four different positions that you've hated, like, it, it's interesting when you, when you go into a position like this, a position where somebody actually cares about who you are and if you fit and then manages you over that three, six, nine months to see how you're doing. And, and you, you said, what are we asking them to do? It shows us that. But the other thing that I think that it shows me is it, it, it shows me what they think they should be doing in that role too, which is really, really powerful for me because a lot of times they think that they need to be doing something when they don't. Like I want them to be in their natural state, but they are actually forcing themselves out of it thinking that they should be somebody that they're not. But I want you that way. So like the, the biggest thing that I've seen is the people on my team, right? My high performing team, our Super Bowl winning team is they, this is another thing that shows them that we care. Like mm -hmm. every quarter when we do a debrief of this and it's like, oh, I remember like Nate and I just did one probably a month ago and he sent me one. He's like, look at the change. We looked at three month difference between one of our like key people and it was a day and night change to who they were now. And they are just like, they're killing it. They're performing really well. They love their job. Everything about it is awesome. It's, and every time we make a, like a significant move, we've made some significant shifts in our accountability chart lately. And so we'll let us, let them settle in and then we'll check on them with this, with the data. Right. And so obviously as an engineer and the profile that I have, uh, there couldn't be anything better for me. Um, other people probably can't, I wouldn't say can't utilize the tool, but probably don't because of their profile. And they just, they'll, they'll get in there, they'll do it, they'll forget about it, and they'll just cause chaos. So I know that you've seen that. So it, it shows me what, they're, what we're asking them to do and also um, what they think they should be doing. And that this shows them even another step that we care about them and we care about their success and their happiness, frankly. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, we say the top graph is the talent and the bottom graph is a management report card. And so why, if I've got somebody that's not performing well, they think they're supposed to be doing something that they're, they're not, well, then whose fault is it? It's the leader's fault. And so that's why it's a management report card because it's so easy for us to say, man, I've got a bad employee. Like very rarely do we ever like look in the mirror and say, hmm, you know, when I interviewed this person, were, were they really one of the, were they really part of the 70% of the workforce that was um, actively disengaged? you know, or disengaged? Probably not. Well, what happened between when I hired and now? Well, you, you led them. You didn't give them what they need. You asked them to do stuff that they're not gifted at, or you didn't give them enough direction. And now they're becoming somebody they're not. So that's why it's a management report card. Yep. It comes down to the, that, that ownership trait, right? That, um, uh, responsibility trait in Gino's book, he called it responsibility. So own, extreme ownership in Jocko Willink is, and Lake's yeah. book, like that, that is it. It all comes down to us. No bad teams, only bad leaders. There's like, it's just, it's, it comes down to you. And that's the thing that I've gotten to know in myself is that, yeah, um, I did, I always look inward before I out, look outward. So you use the, the Jim Collins book, Good to Great. And he talks about the window in the mirror, right? So that, that's what leaders do the window in the mirror analogy in that book. Like, obviously, if you haven't read that book lately, it, I, I'm sure that you're listening to this going, oh yeah, I know that book. Like, yeah, I've read it. Like, go read it again. I just read it. We did a, we, I broke it down in some presentations on the cruise that we did in February for our mastermind group. Um, just getting back in there. The, the interesting thing about great books like that, like <laughs> no pun intended, but really great books is the different times that you read it uh, along your journey in your life, you see different things, you pull different things out of it for what you need to hear at that time. So uh, all the books that are mentioned so far on this podcast are fantastic, but you know, don't just pick it up because this, this is one that at any point in your, in your time, it's valuable. But um, again, don't just go read all three books, like figure out what you need and go get it. So I love this. I, obviously I can talk to you all day. We're running out of time, but um, any, any last things, any last tips that you have for anybody who, um, let's maybe like they're using a personality profile or they've never used one before. Like should they, at a smaller company, we have all kinds of people that listen to this. We have the, the one man show. We have the people who are just thinking about getting into real estate. We have the bigger companies like mine and everywhere in between. Like, what would you recommend if somebody was out there? Um, like kind of, they listen to this podcast. They're like, Oh my gosh, like I have to start doing this. Like, 
what do they do? What's the next step? Yeah. So I think the biggest decisions you'll make as a CEO or entrepreneur are all around human capital, barring occasionally a strategic business pivot or something like that. But again, even then, do you have the right people around you to even execute the business pivot, right? So the most, in my opinion, from what I've seen, the, the most significant and expensive decisions you make are regarding human capital. So if I am a competitive driving guy that wants to win in a business, I'm going to take every advantage I can get. And when it comes to making decisions about people, now with the level of, of science and data that psychometrics can bring to you as a business owner, if you're not taking advantage of that and using it, then, I mean, your, your competitors are. And so why not do that? You know, and like, oh, look, is that Myers-Briggs? Is that DISC? You know, I mean, I've got my opinions on those because I've used those um, before Culture Index. But um, at, at a, at a, my, my whole t goal for, for you guys that are tuning into this is that, that there's been enough value to, to provide a reason for you to block a little time in your calendar to just go study the use of psychometrics in business, whether you want to demo with a culture next program, it really doesn't depend on what size of company you are. I mean, yeah, we're designed for companies that are really trying to scale faster. Um, but again, I mean, I've got small, small clients that, you know, even if you're small and you're like, well, man, I can't afford much. Well, you can't afford one bad hire because when you make a bad decision regarding human capital and you're on a big boat, you don't feel it. But when you're in a rowboat and that one person's not rowing in the right way, that rowboat of five to 10 people is drastically affected because of that decision. And so the whole thing is like, this is, this is, a, it's literally it's able to predict the future for what you're, what's going to happen with your team by looking at the human capital. So my takeaway is just go, make use or make time to study the use of psychometrics uh, in scaling businesses. You know, before, before we like pre-show, we were talking and I was like, we've never done a podcast together. Why not? And your last comment jogged my memory. I just wrote down on my iPad here, ace in the hole and like circled it. So like Matt White has been our ace in the hole for the last couple of years, getting, trying to get ahead of everybody else. The kind, like I, when I remember, I remember having that meeting with you going, oh my gosh, like this is it. Like this is what's going to help us uh, figure this out, grow faster, build our company better. And obviously shared you with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different uh, people in our mastermind uh, group have joined and, and come on as your clients and stuff like that. And I just remember, that, so I'm, I'm sitting here going, that's probably why. Like I really, I think like deep down in, I was a little bit selfish with this and sharing it with some of our mastermind members and stuff, but going out to the entire world on, um, the, how much this has helped us is probably it. You mentioned like, what, a, what does a bad hire cost you? We did some research recently and, uh, and found a couple studies saying that it costs 15 times their salary. Like a bad hire can cost up to 15 times their salary. So, I mean, can you imagine that? Just even just a $30,000 a year person costing you $450,000. And so people kind of balk at the price and it's the same thing. We mentioned, I mentioned like three, three legs of the stool, right? So Dan Coleman, our EOS coach, um, had, talks a lot about this with us. And we talk about how you need to have that peer-to-peer -peer network. And for us, it's in that mastermind group. It's that seven-figure uh, seven figure runway, seven-figure altitude groups for us. So you've got that peer-to-peer -peer network. So somebody to bounce ideas off, not feel isolated, not always feel alone in business. It's very lonely sometimes as an entrepreneur running these companies. It can be. It doesn't have to be. And then you have your coaches and mentors. And that's for me, that's, that's Matt. That's our EOS coach, Dan Coleman. That's my lawyer, my CPA, uh, Chris Picurio, who has been on the podcast before. Dan's been on the podcast. Like, I am introducing you to all of these coaches of mine. And these are people that, that we pay for, as a company to, uh, to bring on to, like with Matt, it's uh, the, you know, the consulting fee to use the uh, organization. With Dan, it's a quarterly uh, fee that we pay each time that he comes out. And I obviously shared recently some of the struggles that I had for me to pay that during this coronavirus and doing it virtually. And I, he's like full price. I was like, well, wait, what full price? Like you're not going to come out here. And so it turned out to be, uh, you heard on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, it turned out to be one of the best decisions that I made. I, I mean, it was like an hour of poor judgment of mine. And of course we need that. Like we need it now more than ever. 
Um, so it, it turned out fantastic. And my team and my staff needed it probably more than I did. And that was an investment in the company and my, and my team. So making sure that you have those coaches and those mentors on your team, it's really, really important. And that's what I look at, at, at you, obviously, as Matt, as like one of my coaches, my mentors, um, you know, one of the people that can really help us and obviously has uh, down the road. So when you, uh, some people will, will be kind of shocked at like pricing and things like that. But I mean, I think exactly what you said is like, you can't afford not to do it. It's it, every, I mean, it's not even a question every year when the bill comes. It's like, okay, pay it. Like we have to pay it. It's, it's a drop in the bucket for, for what could be if we didn't have it. Right. I, I have a guy coming over a friend of mine for dinner and I was talking with him last week. He's not a client, uh, but I just did a demo with him last year and he told me recently, he said, that, that guy that I had installing pumps at pools, you told me he could be fantastic at sales. He said, you know what? He just, he was a top salesman in the franchise brand last quarter. Um, last year, he was installing pumps. And so it's like the cost of not having accurate data to lead and develop your team is way more than the, than the cost of, you know, whatever it would cost to use Culture Index. Well, I hope tonight that he gives you, uh, he, he becomes a client if he needs to, because uh, he should be paying you for that advice. So, um, and if, if, I don't know, I'll send you this recording afterwards, if you want to just clip out the last part and just make sure that he writes the check. Um, you know, it's that we, we talk about traction a lot in, in our business and on this podcast. So it's that right person, right seat from traction yeah. that we talk about so much. And that's what this is. It, you, you got the right person. They might not be in the right seat. You got the um, vice versa. You know, you, you have somebody in the, in the wrong seat, you got to move. If you have the wrong person, they're out, they're gone. It's just, and this will tell you, I mean, we made drastic changes. People say we turned over 110% when Nate came in. Um, what was the reason? Well, the reason was because we could see, we could see the data. We, we could tell, we could see the writing the wall. Like, like Matt said, we could predict the future and we could have gone along and just kind of, you know, puttered along and, and we, we wouldn't have seen the hockey stick growth that we saw. Uh, and this was a huge, uh, a huge piece of that. Hmm. Man, it's really good for me to hear you say that, man, because that's my passion, you know, and you know it. it it's it, it comes from helping business owners, the leaders of leaders, get themselves out of the business if they want to get out and then treat their people in a way that makes them fully engaged and high performers. So thanks, man. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it's it has fundamentally changed the way that I – like the core values that we've created – coupled with the right people in the right seats has been, that's been it. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's, I mean, and Nate even told me the other day, you, you mentioned it maybe 15, 20 minutes ago. He said, I actually don't have to manage our team. Like I, if I had to manage them, they're not the right people. Like our, our leadership team is so strong that they do what they need to do and they manage everybody else. So I actually, if there's a huge fire to put out, then I do it. So obviously him and I are talking about what else can we do together now? So um, some, some really great stuff. I, I thank you. I mean, it's, and I know that everybody that's listening to the podcast, everybody that comes to our events, they see the fruits of all of these labors that have had to go in for all this because obviously my team is rocking and rolling and they're doing the weekly calls with our mastermind members. They're at Flip Hacking Live on stage sharing and presenting. They're developing content and helping me out and doing all that stuff. And now taking over another company because I have the ability to leave that one and come over and buy this one. And now, you know, uh, putting the pedal to the metal on this one now. So, and yep. building it out and, and making sure that we have the right people on the team. So um, thanks, for, thanks Matt for coming on, for sharing um, all your wisdom with us. I think that, you know, the, I think the listeners are going to get a lot from this and I think it's going to, it's going to open a lot of people's eyes and get them scratching their head a little bit about um, doing some research and, and figuring out how, um, how they can implement something like this in their business. Because uh, right now at a time where we're talking about, anxiety levels and stress and what our employees are feeling and how we're feeling as uh, you know business owners it really all comes down to this everybody is looking at this through a different lens and if you think that everybody looks through your lens you're going to be in That's big right. trouble you're not going to be able to lead your team to get them all rowing in the right direction you've really got to think about how everybody is looking at this and not everybody is thinking that this is a huge opportunity they're really excited about it obviously some people are thinking I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job. Some people are thinking, uh, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring or next week or when my kids are going to go back to school and they're freaking out about it when you're just going, ah, I can figure that out in two seconds and just whatever happens, I'll figure it out. I've moved 18 times in the last 18 years and I have a staff member who's a high D and he's moving right now from California to Tennessee and he is going nuts, right? 
So, and I just like pack up the truck. Let's go. Come on. It's not a big deal, man. Like you figure it out get over here. Let's get back to work. It's like, it's a huge thing. Right. And I gotta be, I gotta, I gotta understand that, you know, and I know, I know how it's going for him. Low A, high D. Yeah. You know, speaking of the dot combinations, I know we, we talked about, you know, everyone making some time to research the use of psychometrics. When you're talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, there, many of them are high A and low C's. And so they're more than likely not going to go out of here and make, a, and make time to go and research it. But I would say this, it's like, if, if anybody that's listening to this is interested in just taking the sur- survey, it takes about seven minutes and my, either me or one of my colleagues would be happy to review that with you and, and just help you because we're passionate about helping people do what they're gifted to do and scale their businesses. And so, you know, whether that's just emailing me or, and I can put you in contact with someone that could help you or I'll take it myself. So we'd be happy to do it. Yeah. So what's the best way if they want to do something like that? Obviously um, what's, what's the best way for them to go about it? Do you want, do you want to give out your email on this podcast? Um, Yes, I have a really solid account manager that is high capacity. And so she may be a little slow right now anyway. So yeah, we can, we can give out my email. It's mwhite at cultureindex.com. And like I said, the survey takes about seven minutes. When we typically do this, we want to do a demo. So it's one thing to do one survey and then just look at that survey. But where you see the magic, like what Bill talked about when we sat down over lunch that day, was when you got the data of your whole team in front of you, you can see who's an all-star, who's not, and why. That's when it becomes powerful. Um, and so and we do that. That's a complimentary demo. Like I said, either I would do that if I've got time or one of my colleagues. Uh, we're all trained um, essentially in the same program. So we'd be happy to help out where we can. Okay, so M White at cultureindex.com. So yep. M- Matt White, so M White, like Mike White. Um, I use Mike because that's military, but it's M White, like obviously Matt White. So we, um, so is, could any, do you want anybody to do that? A certain business size, like the demo, like a one man show, yeah, can so get the demo with you? Like, I mean, let's maybe so narrow it down. Yeah, typically, uh, most of our clients are above 25 employees. Um, like I said, we're, that are trying to scale. However, you know, we've got, I've got a few clients that are under 10, not many. Um, but again, it's 30 minutes for the demo. Um, even if we can help you with a little problem up front and you're a smaller company, we'd be happy to. Cool. So, um, so in the subject line, guys, put um, seven figure flipping podcast, uh, email mwhite at cultureindex.com. And in the, in the body of the message, just tell them a little bit about you and your business. Like, Hey, heard you on Bill's podcast. Um, you know, I got three people working for me. This sounds really interesting. Uh, I'd, I'd like to do a survey and, um, and do a demo with you. So put that information in there. If it's just like you blasting uh, Matt and not giving him a bunch of information and stuff like that, like just do me a favor. I, he gets a lot of emails. He's very busy. Um, just respect his time. So just shoot him an email with some of those uh, seven figure flipping podcasts in the subject line, some information about you and give him all, everything that he needs up front to limit the back and forth, back and forth. Cause look, I get, I get a ton of emails from this podcast. I get a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me for uh, mentorship, for help, all this stuff. And it's, it's overwhelming for sure. And I know how many people listen to this podcast. I know how many people could uh, potentially email him. So I'm really going to challenge you guys to, um, to obviously respect him and his time. He's been really gracious with it here on the podcast and I appreciate that. So Matt, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I, it, it, I realize that I'm at high A, I'm a low C. Um, you have to kind of poke me sometimes like, hey, how are you doing? I don't uh, typically reach out to you and I'm glad you did because I said, dude, let's do a podcast. This is like perfect yeah. timing. And so um, thanks for coming on at such short notice. I think this is gonna be huge value to everybody out there. I think it, it's, this is really the time where we need this stuff, the personality profiles, the management of our team, really thinking about other people instead of just us, looking through a different lens. All of that stuff is, is, is really big takeaways from this. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think this is gonna be really great and a, a much needed a message at a time like it is right now. Yeah. Well, man, I appreciate the invite. Got a lot of value out of it myself. Um, mainly just because I love to hear my clients that are winning with the program. So that was really fun. Thanks, Bill. You're doing a great job with the program.
Thanks. Well, it's mostly Nate now. So, um, but I, I, I love it. Like we, uh, anyway, we get, uh, we could we could talk about it for a while. Uh, everybody's going to make their own decision. I'm obviously not a uh, culture index salesperson, but I am a I'm a walking talking billboard for them. There's no doubt about it. So, uh, Matt, thanks for uh, hanging out with me and everybody that's listening. Thanks so much. We'll kind of see you on the next podcast. Remember, we're doing this um, probably for the next four four or five weeks, something like that. I'm going to be putting out some little bit different content. Might be some interviews like this. Might be just me talking, sharing a message, things like that. Um, I, what I'm really trying to do is I'm really trying to get you guys what you need right now. So as the environment and landscape changes over the next few weeks, the next few months, and we see what happens with the real estate market and environment, um, reach out to us at info at sevenfigureflipping.com. So info at sevenfigureflipping.com and just tell us what you want or go into our free Facebook group, the Seven Figure House Flipping and Wholesaling Facebook group or message us on Instagram at Seven Figure Flipping and just tell us what you guys are struggling with, what you guys need, the message that you need. If I, even if it's a specific deal or something like creative financing, seller finance, whatever it is that you guys want to know about is I want to make sure that we spend this time right now with you guys, giving you as much value as you can for yourself and your business. So that's really going to help me help you guys. So I'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. And as always, you guys can check out all of our information uh, about us and all of our events and everything at sevenfigureflipping.com. See you. You've been listening to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. If you're ready to learn the house flipping and wholesaling strategies that are working right now in today's market, check out sevenfigureflipping.com.